grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Although I count it a privilege to be able to stand before you this morning, I am also aware that to do so continues to be an act of faith and trust. Faith that Father can use me as he sees fit and trust that he will use me as he sees fit. A number of years ago, I began asking the Father to reveal light on certain scriptural passages that I wanted and needed help with. And at the time, I didn't fully appreciate the divine principle of taking in order to give. I thought the revelations were for me. <laughs> and if others wanted and or needed revelations, well, they could ask the Father themselves. Um, Later, the Father asked me to share, and I thought sharing meant to talk with my wife about them. And so I would talk with my wife about the things that I was studying and, 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 and thinking about and considering. Um, but I believe he meant it in a much broader broader sense. And so I would share with others of my immediate family. <laughs> um, still hesitant. Um, and so we've been on a journey, Father and I. <laughs> and here we are nearing the end of this camp meeting session and I'm trusting him to present another message. So at this time, uh, I would like to invite you to join me in prayer as we ask for a special blessing for this time, uh, a special anointing for our minds and, and for myself as I present this message. Child of God. Father, it's your time, and these are your people. Father, you know the innermost workings of our hearts and our minds. You know what we are experiencing, and you know what we are in need of at this time. So, Father, we humbly ask that you will allow the presence of your spirit to bless us in a special way as we study together this morning. We ask, Father, that you will take away distractions and anything that would prevent us from clearly hearing your voice. And Father, I ask that you will hide me and make known to your people your son. And as we behold him, Father, may we be changed according to your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Child of God. In the book of Luke, the second chapter, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Beginning in verse 40, we have this synopsis of the childhood of the Savior. And the Bible records it this way. And the child grew 
and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's it. Simple, concise. There isn't a whole lot of detail presented. But in these words, we see that the child grew. The child was like other children. Growing both physically, spiritually. Growing in the knowledge of God. Waxed strong in spirit. The spirit of prophecy lets us know that Although his was an ordinary childhood to some degree, his was also an extraordinary childhood as well. The trials and temptations that he was called upon to bear continuously as he was attacked by the evil one over and over and over again. Now, no child of God has been called upon to bear that type of childhood. Extraordinary. But we know that he was an overcomer, a continuous overcomer. I want to share just some words from Desire of Ages discussing the childhood of the Savior. The childhood and, and youth of Jesus was spent in a little mountain village. Now, there was no place on earth that would not have been honored by his presence the palaces of kings would have been privileged in receiving him as a guest, but he passed by the homes of wealth, the courts of royalty, and the renowned seats of learning to make his home an obscure and despised Nazareth. She goes on to say that wonderful in its, in its significance is the brief record of his early life. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In the sunlight of his father's countenance, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. His mind was active and penetrating with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. No hurry, no fast paced, but gradually. That nothing could disturb. I'm sorry, as a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. With deep earnestness, the mother of Jesus watched the unfolding of his powers and beheld the impress of perfection upon his character. With delight, she, she sought to encourage that bright, receptive mind. Through the Holy Spirit, she received wisdom to cooperate with the heavenly agencies in the development of this child who could claim only God as his father. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood, the children should be taught of his goodness and his greatness, especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel, song and prayer 
and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. Fathers and mothers were to instruct their children that the law of God is an expression of his character and that as they received the principles of the law into the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral. But the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament. Scriptures were opened to their study. When the question was asked during the Savior's ministry, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? This does not indicate that Jesus was unable to read, but merely that he had not received a rabbinical education. Since he gained knowledge as we may do, his intimate acquaintance with the scriptures shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's word. And spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. Apart from the unholy ways of the world, he gathered stores of scientific knowledge from nature. He studied the life of plants and animals and the life of man. From his earliest years, he was possessed of one purpose. He lived to bless others. For this, he found resources in nature. New ideas of ways and means flashed into his mind as he studied plant life and animal life. Continually, he was seeking to draw from things seen, illustrations by which to present the living oracles of God. The parables by which during his ministry, he loved to teach his lessons of truth show how open his spirit was to the influence of nature and how he had gathered the spiritual teaching from the surroundings of his daily life. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. As we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through his word, angels will draw near. Our minds will be strengthened. Our characters will be elevated and refined. We shall become more like our Savior. And as we behold the beautiful and grand in nature, our affections go out after God. While the spirit is awed, the soul is invigorated by coming in contact with the infinite through his works. Communion with God through prayer develops the mental and moral faculties and the spiritual power strengthen as we cultivate thoughts upon spiritual things. The life of Jesus was in a harmony with God. What he taught, he lived. What he taught, he was. His words were the expression, not only of his own life experience, but of his own character. Not only did he teach the truth, but he was the truth. And it was this that gave his teaching power. There's a song written by Gloria Gaither. called Ordinary Baby. Are you familiar with that song? I would listen to that song over and over again because unlike so many songs, the words were so in harmony with scripture and how I understood our Savior to be. The words say he was just an ordinary baby. That's the way he planned it. Maybe. Anything but common would have kept him apart, apart from the children that he came to rescue, limited to some elite few, when he was the only child who ever asked to be born. 
And he came to us with eyes wide open, knowing how we're hurt and broken, choosing to partake of all our joy and pain. He was just an ordinary baby. That's the way he planned it, maybe. So that we could come to him and not be afraid. He was ordinary with exception of miraculous conception. Both his birth and death he planned from the start. But between his entrance and his exit was a life that has affected everyone who's walked the earth to this very day. With no airs of condescension, he became God's pure extension, giving you and me the chance to be remade. He was just an ordinary baby. That's the way he planned it, maybe, so that we could come to him. So that we could come to him and not be afraid. There was a plan. This plan of salvation father and son developed together. And there is a peculiar aspect of this plan that I find is often overlooked. This aspect in part answers the question of why. In the SDA Bible commentary, Volume 1, page 1082, I found these words that God created man for his own glory. That after test and, and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. Do we believe that? Here's another one, Review and Herald, May 29, 1900. The vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by the redeemed of the Lord. Do we believe that? Another one. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. Adam was to be tested to see whether he would be obedient as the loyal angels or disobedient. If he stood the test, his instruction to his children would have been only of, only of loyalty. His mind and thoughts would have been as the mind and thoughts of God. And then we read in Hebrews that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, that means he doesn't change. And then again in Malachi 3, 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So if this was his plan then, it must be his plan now. to repopulate heaven with the redeemed of the Lord. There was something interesting that came to me in my studies. I was reading in the book of Luke And I was going along with the Sabbath school lesson from long ago. A 
Sabbath school lesson was on the life of Christ, and I believe the chapter in Luke was Luke chapter 2, where we read earlier. But this time it was verse 8 and, and 9. Now these are familiar verses, I'm sure. And, and I had read them, I don't know how many times. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And then the message, For unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now the Sabbath school lesson had asked a question that inferred that the angel of the Lord, as depicted here, was Christ. That set up an, an immediate conflict in my mind because unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. So if Christ the Lord was born this day in the city David, Christ the Lord, could not have also appeared to the shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And so I went through the scriptures looking at this angel of the Lord. And of course, we, we will see that the angel of the Lord is, in fact, at times, Christ. But then there are other times in which the angel of the Lord cannot be Christ, such as this one here. And if we look at the word angel, we know that it's simply messenger. And so I don't believe it will do damage to scripture by substituting messenger of the Lord in this verse. And so I looked at it more as a role versus a person. a role that can be filled by an angelic being, a divine being, and perhaps even a human being. Let's take some time to look at the angel of the Lord, shall we? We go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 16. And this is the story of Hagar and Ishmael. In verse 7 we read, And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? 
And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. The angel came to bear tidings of the birth of a child. Verse 13, she says, Then she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seeth me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Be'er Laharoi, behold, it is between Kadesh and Barad. Who is this angel of the Lord here? Can we be certain? Is it the Lord our Savior? Which verse? Verse 10. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Speaking in first person, I will do this. Let's look at another one. Genesis chapter 22. This story we know. In verse 10, Abraham had stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. In verse 11, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou any unto him, anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Do we know who that one is? I know that thou fearest God. I know that you have an understanding and knowledge of God based on this experience that you've just gone through because you have not withheld your only son from me. I believe we can safely say that again. That's, that's our Lord. The one in Judges is particularly interesting. In Judges chapter 13. In Judges chapter 13, we have many lessons about children. We come to understand that many whom God would use as his instruments have been disqualified at their birth by the previous wrong habits of their parents. When the Lord would raise up Samson as a deliverer, he deliverer of his people, he enjoined upon the mother correct habits of life before the birth of her child. And in instructing this one mother, the Lord gave a lesson to all who should be mothers to the close of time. Judges chapter 13. Beginning of verse 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, 
For the child shall be a Nazareth unto God from the womb. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Verse 6, then the woman came and told her husband, saying, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. But he said unto me, behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, and said, O my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send me come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spaketh unto the woman? He said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and, and, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid with the meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on the ground, fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did not appear, did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. Secret. Doesn't tell his name. The woman described him as a man of God whose countenance was like the countenance of an angel. There's something about spending time in the presence of God that changes your countenance. We have recorded for us in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, If we begin with verse 28, we, we read these words, and he, that's Moses, was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. 
And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And in verse 33, we read that until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Forty days and forty nights with the Savior caused Moses' face to shine. to shine so much so that he had to put a veil over his face so that the people could look on him. Let's keep that in mind. We have the testimony of one who, like the Son of God, had a particular testimony, a specific testimony. We know that the Son of God, when he was baptized, the testimony given was that, lo, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We know that it's a testimony of a, of a child of God. Because we also read that the seventh from Adam had a similar testimony. If we turn over to the book of Hebrews and reading through the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, And looking at verse 5, we see that by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And it was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That, I believe, is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The biblical account of, of Enoch was that he was not, for God took him. And if we believe that those peculiar aspects of the plan of, of salvation that are often overlooked... those peculiar aspects that state that God created man for his own glory, that after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family, that it was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. Who would be the first to begin that repopulation process? His name means initiated. Enoch. He was taken. If Enoch was taken, it's hard for me to fathom that he has been spending all of this time in idleness. That's contrary to the principle of God. Children were not to be idle. So the children of God, not idle. Moses' face shone brightly after 40 days and 40 nights in the very presence of God. How long has Enoch been with God? Not 40 days and 40 nights. Not 400 days and nights. Over 4,000 years. If 
Enoch were to appear, what would he look like? Could it be that he would appear as an angel? Shining so brightly from being in the presence of God for so long, beholding his glory for so long, for so long that he begins to look like Savior. In the book of Daniel, we read of the only other angel besides Michael, who is the Word of God, named in Scripture. That angel is none other than Gabriel. And there's something interesting about Gabriel. We know that he took the place of Lucifer. But then we also read from Ellen G. White that it was the purpose of God to replace Satan and those angels that fell with those of the human family. And it's interesting that Gabriel's name means man of God. For me, I take comfort in the consistency, knowing that God doesn't change. And that he has a particular plan in mind for each and every one of us. I see a pattern that the time spent in close communion with the Son of God changes you. And the more time spent, the more you are changed and the more you start to look like the Savior not only spiritually, but physically. I don't know if you will find conclusive evidence in the scriptural story of just who Gabriel is, but for consistency's sake, If he took the place of Lucifer, it would be consistent that he would be a man. And if we go throughout scripture and looking at the possibilities of who this man could be, it would be consistent that he would be Enoch, initiated, whom God took. For me, it would be consistent that Enoch would want to play a particular role in the plan of salvation. Again, not conclusive scripturally, but for me. These are his descendants, this was his lineage. His line. I'm not satisfied with Enoch doing nothing for all these years. But 
but it becomes particularly important to me when looking at the Savior's life and knowing that there were times when he needed and desired the companionship of humans for comfort and for strength and for encouragement. For me, when I, when I question and, I, and I'm wondering, like, does it even matter when I get up and speak? Does it, does, does it even matter? Or is anybody affected? Or, or are there people blessed? It's encouraging to know when I hear a testimony that this particular aspect God used to change this situation or, or that situation. And so when I see in the life of Christ, when he's transfigured, I see Moses and Elijah, men who have been taken. And so I wonder about Enoch. Why wouldn't Enoch come and encourage as well? And then so for me, when I see our Savior struggling in Gethsemane, knowing that that's a struggle that we all will go through, and I see him drinking that cup, and I see an angel of the Lord dispatched to him, For me, it strengthens me if I see that angel, Gabriel, as Enoch, as a man of God, as one who has spent so much time with him, that he's able to provide a level of encouragement that no other human can. And as I read that the secret to overcoming, as found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the testimony, that testimony that Enoch bared, that he pleased God. That's a testimony for all of us. Because when I read in Psalm 1611 that at his right hand are pleasures forevermore, and when I read in Isaiah 62, 4 that thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, but shall be called Hepzibah, my pleasure. One day all of the redeemed, all of the pleasures will be at his right hand. I believe that we can be one of them. True children of God. Children in whom he is well pleased. Just like his only begotten son. And that we'll take our places as well. As heaven is repopulated. With the redeemed as we join that heavenly family, the sons and daughters of God. It's my desire to be among them. And I hope it's your desire. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, the privilege of being called your sons and daughters is one that we desire. And Father, we know it's one that you desire as well. So Father, that change that you desire to see in us, that transformation of making us like your only begotten son, May it be completed in us. 
may your son live in us as the hope of glory. May we truly be changed by beholding him. May our faces be lighted up and shining. May we be your true witnesses as the work is finished and as we prepare to go home. Father, may these blessings be ours according to your will. In Jesus' name.